Good afternoon, everybody. Um, so a few years ago, I wrote a little paper with my co-authors on the likelihood or not of dinosaurs being primitively feathered. And this is a, a kind of update to that earlier work. If I can make the thing work. So for about 25 years now, we've seen a step change in our understanding of dinosaurian biology and evolution. The discovery of beautiful feathered dinosaur, non-avian dinosaur feathers, in particular from the Jehul group of China, but also from now some other Lagerstadt around the world, have proved incontrovertibly that at least a number of these animals, in particular Silurosaurian theropods, are covered in a pelage ranging from basically fine filaments all the way through to things that are complex branch structures on their way to being the sorts of fully fledged fright feathers that we might see in a bird. That story is also taken on. Oh, Jesus. That story is also taken on an additional twist recently with the discovery of other taxa outside of Theropoda, which also have unusual integumentary structures. The first one of those, obviously, was this little animal, Tachosaurus, that's known with these weird quills on the tail, but actually, uh, more spectacularly and more recently, this very cute little animal called Colindodromius from Siberia, which has a variety of six or uh, five or six different integumentary tripes covering its body, some of which are eerily reminiscent of feathers, others of which are very bizarre and don't seem to have any analogue among living animals. So we basically have a distribution of something like 40-odd non-avian Silurosaur taxa that have feathers or filamentous-like structures on their skin. We also have one or two ornithischians with weird things going on with their skin also. And this has led some people to speculate on the evolutionary history of feathers and feather-like structures within Dinosauria as a whole. Most of this, though, is frankly speculation. It's by eye optimization onto cherry-picked phylogenies and also using cherry-picked taxa to um, decide where these things should fit on the tree. So no one would really argue with the fact that feathers or filamentous-like structures seem to be primitive for, for Silurosauria. Every clade within Silurosauria has very good feathered members. Even in those stupid animals, Tyrannosaurs, uh, we know that they were primitively had some fuzz on them, at least even if, for example, the most stupid animal of all time, Tyrannosaurus rex, may have been <laughs> primarily scaly from new uh, work on skin impressions in that particular taxon. But these occurrences in things like Cetacosaurus, Tianulong, and now Colindodromius have led people to speculate that maybe all dinosaurs were fuzzy or feathered. And this is a view that's gaining traction. You see this um, now in a number of textbooks. A couple of people will say this out loud uh, quite often. Um, but what is the actual basis for optimizing this feature back down um, to the base of Dinosauria? There's some interesting things going on in terms of developmental genetics in living animals, in terms of the homology of the dermal placodes that lead to scales and that lead to feathers and various other things. So there is some deep, deep homology between scales and feathers. There seems to be a lot of homoplasia in where these things pop up on the tree in general. And reptiles are doing weird things with their skin. Mammals are, are kind of uh, are biased towards thinking that other amniotes are boring in terms of skin structures, but actually the real action in skin evolution is in sauropsids, where you get the evolution of armor repeatedly, you get the evolution of feathers or feather-like structures repeatedly, and you've also got naked skin and various other things going on as well. So there's a lot of work that still remains to be done on skin evolution on the sauropsid part of the tree. So the big question is, though, when we're thinking about early dinosaurs, and in fact the basal members of most dinosaur clades, are we dealing with this more traditional view now of thinking of dinosaurs as scaly reptile-like animals, or are we getting something else instead, which is that these animals should all be primitively covered with a nice fluffy um, photogenic pelage of feathers? So in order to look at that, because as I said, uh, in 2015, uh, Dave, Nick and I published a paper in Biology Letters where we argued on the basis of empirical data, dread the thought it's actually based on real data rather than inferred, hoped for data, um, and we suggested that dinosaurs are not primitively feathered or scaled on the uh, basis of basically maximum likelihood of optimizations of those, optimizations of those characters and ancestral state reconstructions. Uh, but as far as I can tell, nobody either read that paper or they all disagree with it or they just don't like it. So I, I basically decided we should go back and do this again. And this was prompted by an invitation from Molly Rauhut and Christian Foth, who are putting together a book on skin evolution. And so we thought that we should probably get around to doing something. So what we did was we took our original data set, which contains all known non-avian dinosaurs where we have some direct 
evidence of skin preservation. And that's slightly different from our original one just because of discoveries in between. There's a big caveat here. This represents only 7% of Mesozoic dinosaur diversity. That's only 7% of what we know about. And almost all of those instances are from the Cretaceous. We have almost no data from the Jurassic and no data from the Triassic. So those are two big caveats to bear in mind. We scored each of those taxa for the presence or absence of scales, filaments, and various complex and sorts of complex feathers. We treated those characters as binary or multistate. We had uh, crocs as an outgroup, which we didn't do before, so that was a change from the previous analysis. We also did something weird with pterosaurs. So although pterosaurs could be primitively scaly or could be primitively fuzzy, the jury is actually still out because there aren't that many pterosaurs that have pycnofibers preserved where you can actually get direct evidence of what they look like. We also included a new character state for pterosaurs just to annoy Dave Unwin which is called naked because we thought Dave would like their having a character state that was slightly risque <laughs> and risk naked simply means they have they have basically a leathery skin they don't have scales or they don't have feathers and we treated those three things separately also and we also ran given that for some reason there may be some bias in the uh, authorship team towards there being more than one dinosaur tree we also ran them over different versions of the dinosaur tree, whether the traditional tree or the ornithoscolidum one. So we did maximum likelihood reconstructions of ancestral character states for each of these in R. We scaled the branches in various different ways. Again, we played around with various permutations of that and different kinds of branch length method. We also applied for the first time several different types of models of character evolution to the data. So we looked at an equal rates model, we looked at an ordered models, an unequal rates model, and a very kind of extreme progressive model that pre prevents um, reversals, to, uh, a progressive model of evolution, just to see how well they all fitted the data. We looked at these different uh, things and compared them using non-parametric maneuvers and see how these different effects might affect what's going on with the character optimizations. And we also, because one of the original criticisms of our first paper was everyone says, what happens if tomorrow we find a Triassic jet hole? And that Triassic jet hole has a bunch of feathered animals in. So we don't have a Triassic jet hole. Uh, but we can make hypothetical animals of the right age that we can insert into the trees to see what effects they might have on these character optimizations and to give us some form of um, ground truthing, if you like, on how robust these kinds of conclusions might be. So the grand uptake of this with all sorts of different permutations of the different models, the way we treated the characters, the way we decided whether pterosaurs were scaly or naked or whether they had filaments, uh, primitively and what happens with those hypothetical Triassic members of the clade was we ended up with 88 different model fitting exercises um, in total and then we basically looked at different models of evolution and how they fitted those types of um, distributions and we basically found that the best one based on the basis of AIC weights was the ordered model of character evolution so most of the things I'm going to show you now in terms of results are based on that ordered model. So here are some of the results. And I'm just going to run through a few different trees just to give you an idea of what they look like. So these little pie charts are basically the uh, likelihoods of different types of ancestral character at each of those nodes. Uh, for ease of um, recognition, the red circles are scales, blues are <coughs> complex feathers, sorry, greens complex feathers, and blue are simple feathers in general. So this is probably the most conservative optimization. This is the optimization that basically decides that pterosaurs are a scaly outgroup to dinosaurs. Uh, other than that, it's a fairly uh, vanilla version of the model. Two different versions of it run on two different types of tree topology. And under this particular optimization, you can see that dinosaurs, the, high, the likelihood of them being scaled primitively is very, very high. Yes, it's obvious that kind of things like Theropods are feathered, uncontrovertible, uh, that they're going to be uh, feathered at some point in their evolutionary history. Theropods, oops, oh, now it works. Theropods are uh, actually doing something uh, slightly different, a bit more ambiguous, possibly still scaly, because there are not so many Silurosaurian theropods with any evidence of uh, integumentary structure, structures outside them, just one or two. So, and even with those three feathery ornithischians in the tree, it does not affect the fact that ornithischians would be, have a scaled ancestor. Instead, what it looks like is homoplasy. And actually, a lot of our results line up in the same way. And this is something we speculated on in our 2015 paper, and we speculate on a bit more with a bit more evidence 
in the paper that we have in press in Ollie's volume, and that it looks to us very much like those features that we see in ornithischians are not necessarily true feather homologues. They could just be other experiments in playing around with integumentary structures. In the same way that if you look at squamates, for example, they don't all get covered in nice pebbly scales. Some of them have long fringing scales. Some of them have brush-like scales. They play around with scales. So it could be that some of these things are not really genuinely anything to do with the feather story, but merely other inventions of uh, integumentary structures that they're just inventing on, on, the, um, on the sly. So I had a lot of coffee today, if you haven't guessed that. So uh, this is another optimization. This one is a less conservative optimization. This one assumes fuzzy pterosaurs. So that all pterosaurs primitively have pycna fibers. And you can see, again, if you look at those, uh, there is a bit more support for having a feathered or filamentous ancestor for dinosauria, but it's actually not that high. It's actually still very low. And that's despite the fact we are now trying to force that character down the tree, uh, down these branches, and try and recover something that might be a fuzzy dinosaur ancestor. But even having a fuzzy pterosaur doesn't do that. It doesn't really optimize those things further down. And again, despite having all three fuzzy ornithischians in there too. So this is a summary of the various permutations we did that excluded the hypothetical taxa. And what we're looking at here are box plots for each of the two alternative topologies. And each of those little categories along the bottom refers to one particular node on the tree. So dinosaurs, ornithischians, theropods, saurosaurs, so on. And what you can see is that when we look at the dinosaurian plots, regardless of tree topology, scales are definitely winning. It's only when we look at theropods and saurosaurs that we see something a bit more ambiguous for theropods, and then we see a, more, a definite bias towards uh, feathers for saurosaurs, the latter being effectively a no-brainer. So what happens when we start thinking about our theoretical Jehol Lagerstatten that are still unfortunately undiscovered, but would genuinely be very helpful in resolving this question? So again, this is now comparing not two versions of the dinosaur tree, uh, just because we think the traditional tree deserves some airtime, we just uh, use these ones to illustrate the point here, but we have got the ornithodiron versions too. But this is between, again, in this case, our permutation is changing the skin condition in pterosaurs. And this is what happens to those figures when we decide to add in a Triassic ornithischian with feathers. Uh, so what happens when we have a scaly pterosaur is that not a lot happens. We still have a prevalence of results that suggest that actually at the base of the tree, scales are still primitive, even if we have a Triassic feathered ornithischian. However, that flips on a coin when we look at uh, adding in a feathered pterosaur, and then suddenly that situation almost exactly reverses. And instead, this is the first time we actually start to get support. But this is adding in a taxon that doesn't yet exist and may never exist. But this is one way of forcing dinosaurs to do it that overturns the actual empirical evidence. What happens if we add a Triassic feathered theropod instead? Well, actually, if we do that, almost nothing happens. Certainly in terms of having a scaly pterosaur, again, no change. And although there's a bit more support for having a feathered uh, dinosaur ancestor, primarily due to having something that's much older, pulling those likelihoods further down, we still end up with more support for a scaly um, ancestor. So the most extreme example Let's have three hypothetical animals from this um, biota, including which would be, for example, the first ever feathered sauropodomorph. Um, <laughs> so not only would it be a Triassic feathered one, but it would just be, a, this would be a nature paper. If you guys find that animal, I called it here, I want an authorship. I don't care where, uh, but I want an authorship if you do find it. And Sauropodomorpha, incidentally, the one, the one dinosaur clay for which there is nothing. But equally, there aren't that many skin impressions for Sauropodomorphs in general either, to be fair. But this is the case where finally, finally that dream comes true of making all dinosaurs feathered. But to do it, we have to go out and discover three animals that don't yet exist from a deposit that hasn't yet been found. So as at heart, I am an empiricist, possibly because I'm a simpleton, but I am an empiricist. I think we have to go with the data as they currently are, rather than extrapolating beyond it because it sounds cooler, uh, which unfortunately seems to be the trap that a number of my colleagues have fallen into. So that brings us back to our original question. What should those early dinosaurs look like? And I would say if you read the balance of stuff that's going on today, a lot of people would be very happy with this beautiful picture by Mark where he um, blings up uh, Laquintosaurus down close to the base of the Ornithischian tree. But for the time being, although it's a beautiful image, 
I think we should probably be reverting to the original version of that image for the, at least until we find this Triassic Lagerstatt uh, and then think of these as scaly animals. So there are a couple of um, things that people can argue against. One is dysphonomy. Uh, it could simply be we haven't got the right taphonomic windows to really properly assess the distribution in dinosaurs. Not true, we do have windows that actually preserve these kinds of animals alongside feather theropods as well. No evidence of feathers in most of these. And incidentally, as far as I'm aware, there's only like one specimen of several thousand specimens of Sacosaurus that have quills. So it's not necessarily that widespread. Another thing is, and this is because, as you all know, Dave Unwin's a very lazy person. And he's never, no one uh, really in the pterosaur world has really had a look properly at uh, pterosaur skin evolution. It's partly because of a dearth of specimens, partly because of some, the, the way they're spread out and so on, but it could be there's actually something really interesting going on in pterosaur evolution. My suspicion for pterosaurs is actually they primitively lose scales and then become fuzzy later on, and they do something very weird in their skin evolution, which was also fit with other weird skin evolutions, things going on in sauropsids. So just to conclude very quickly, uh, at the moment, the empirical data on this do not support dinosaurs being primitively fuzzy. They're probably still scaled. That could change if we find an, a Triassic or an early Jurassic sauropodomorph or ornithischian that might change that pattern. At the moment, I don't think the taphonomic argument is particularly convincing. They're kind of just a straw man. Pterosaurs definitely need another look. It would be really good to pin down whether they're primitively fuzzy or not. And frankly, as I said, I'm an empiricist, so I'd rather see that we base our deductions on these animals on the evidence we have to hand rather than filling in gaps between things. So thank you very much.